Okay, so this is going to be part two of chapter 54. So now we're going to get into relationships within a community. So what we're going to start with is going to be predation. And predation technically is when a predator eats prey, right? That's a nice easy test question, right? Um, so technically herbivores are going to be considered to be predators because herbivores eat other living organisms, even though they're plants, right? So herbivores are going to be predators. Um, parasites. Parasites tend to be considered to be predators as well because they live on a host and they actually harm the host in, in um, exchange for nutrition. So even sometimes parasites are going to kill the host and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So if I was going to say let's design the most awesome predator, hopefully some things will come to mind, such as um, claws, teeth, fangs, poison, heat sensing organs, speed, agility, and I'm, I'm sure there's many more. So not only do prey have adaptations to get away from predators, but predators are going to have adaptations to get the prey. So you got to think of it on both sides. So now let's get into the prey side and talk about defense mechanisms that organisms can have. So first of all, we've got plant defenses. So plants are kind of screwed, right? Because they're sitting there in the ground and they're like, oh, I really hope that thing doesn't bite me, right? I mean, that sucks. So if they're going to be stuck in the ground like that, they're going to have to have some sort of chemicals that will ward them away or maybe thorns or spines or something like that. Um, so plant defenses, we are going to go over that in an entire chapter, and it's pretty cool some of the chemicals they've come up with. Um, and, of course, we found ways to manipulate them and make cigarettes or whatever out of them, right? Um, so let's talk about animal defenses next. So there's a lot of things that animals can do, um, and one thing they can do is behaviorally, right? So if I said, okay, a predator is coming after you right now, what are you going to do? Well, you would run, you would hide, you would flee, you could do all sorts of things, right? Um, another thing that they can do is they can um, make themselves appear larger so they can kind of blow themselves up, like if you think of a puffer fish. Um, they can make different noises, so they can actually make deeper noises to make themselves sound a lot larger than they are. And a really cool thing that they can do is something called mobbing. And mobbing is going to be when the prey goes, wait, there's like 500 of us. Like, why are we all running from this predator? Let's take the predator on. And they go after the predator. So I actually have a really cool video of that, and um, I'll post a link to that underneath this um, in uh, the class videos section. Super, super cool. Okay, another thing that they can do is they can fake injury or death, right? If you think about a possum, a possum can play dead. That's a way that they can get out of predators. Um, another one that's really neat is the kill deer, and I have a little um, video here that I can show you. Make it a little bit larger. So this is um, that little bird that you see right there is the kill deer. And what happens is when they see a predator coming towards their nest, they want to protect their young, so they'll sacrifice themselves in order to do that. So what they'll do is they'll actually limp and bring their wing around so it looks like their wing is broken and that they're easy to catch so that the predator will actually be diverted towards them. So let me turn down the volume a little. It was a little loud earlier. Um, hopefully this won't be this patchy. Um, so you can see this little kill deer they're chasing him with the camera. And what he's going to do is eventually, there you go, it's going to kind of do that crazy thing with its wing, and sometimes they even limp like this to say, okay, like, don't go after me, or don't go after my nest, come after me, I'm the one you want. So it's kind of interesting, that ultimate sacrifice, because their genes have been passed on, right? So um, that's the kill deer broken wing act. It's pretty hilarious. So um, really, really interesting things that animals will do to kind of, you know, behaviorally get predators uninterested in them. Oops. There we are. Okay. Um, so another thing that they can do is camouflage. And obviously you've heard of camouflage before. They're trying to blend in with their surroundings. Super cool stuff that they can do there. So here are a couple pictures of some ideas. So you can see this frog right here blending in with that environment, that rock behind him. Um, and this next one, you can see a flounder. And so the flounder is right here, but look at how that coloration helps it to blend in with the sand behind it. And there's actually another one lower down on this picture. Not as great, but still you can see that mottled color and how it can blend in with that environment. Um, in this next one, this is something a little closer to home. You can see that um, bighorn sheep. 
uh, right there. And so you can see how that blends in. So, I mean, a little more obvious, but still, you could see why they have that coloration and why half the time when you see people looking at something on I-70 and you can't see it, that might be why, right? Um, and then here's an elephant. And I know it's like, okay, there's a huge elephant floor. But if you look at the color, I mean, it's not like it's bright blue or something like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, and this next one, just a great picture. I just love that picture. But anyway, um, oh, here we go. Why does my computer always do that? Um, you can see how this snake was blending in perfectly with these layers right here. I actually read the story behind this picture and the snake did not, did not end up eating that because it was just too much to get it out of the water. Um, in this next one, here's some more examples. So here's that ghost crab I showed you in the previous video, blending in with the sand behind it. This moth is trying to blend in with the bark. This is another great picture right here. I don't know if you can tell, but this right here, this right here, and this right here are actually what are called pipe fish. They're related to seahorses. And so they're colored to look like the grass. But what else is really cool is that they're actually behaving like the grass. So they're kind of stiff and kind of going with the water. So really neat how that works. Now in this next slide, um, there's a couple of things that I'd like you to notice about these. So I don't know if you've ever looked at a fish, but usually a fish is a lot darker in its belly than it is on the top. And the reason for that is because if you're a predator looking up at the surface of the water, the sun's going to be there. And so the water's going to look very bright white. So if they have that white belly, then they're going to blend in when someone's looking from down below up at them. Um, so you can really see that apparently here. Now I know this great white, I don't, there's not a lot of things that are going to sneak up on it, but um, the other thing you want to notice is how dark the top is and how dark the water is, right? So um, obviously not with a great white, but with um, smaller fish, right? If birds are going to be diving down and feeding on them, it would help to have that dark coloration on the top so that they blend in when there's something looking from the sky down into the water. Um, these two things here are going to be what are called eye spots. This is a picture I took in Costa Rica of this moth, and obviously you can tell what this is trying to mimic, right? It's trying to look like an owl. Super cool how it does that, right? And so obviously birds like to eat moths, but they're not going to go after an owl, so that's what it's designed to look like. Um, over here, this is another really neat thing. This is an eye spot as well right here. So what this fish is doing, and this is just hilarious, is first of all, you see how it has this band, and that band goes right through its eye. That's kind of to help it camouflage its eye, and that will trick predators into thinking this right here is its um, actual face, and that's its eye. So what happens is when predators are swimming after this guy, they're going to automatically deflect to the right, to get to that, um, you know, because they're going to think it's going to flee, and that's where its head is, and so they're going to try and go that way. But what happens is the fish actually takes off in the opposite direction, and he's like, hey, that wasn't my eye, sorry. So kind of cool how it can do that, right? So those are eye spots. Okay. Um, so that was camouflage. All of that was camouflage. Mechanical defenses. So, of course, animals can have mechanical defenses in the form of spines. Um, I put a plant in there, too, because we didn't have a picture for that earlier. So, you know, there's spines. But there's a blowfish that's got some spines, porcupines, right? So those are going to be what are called mechanical defenses. Uh, and this next one are chemical defenses. These two right here are going to be what are called stink bugs. I don't know if you've ever encountered one. I had one fly into my car last summer and I was like, oh my god, I'm not doing anything because I don't want that thing to release its chemicals. Um, so what they do is they just re release something that stinks really bad, like a skunk, right? Same idea. Um, over here you've got two organisms that are going to sting when they get attacked, right? So that's another thing that they can do. Now the one thing I want you to notice about this stink bug here is obviously that is not designed to blend in with any sort of environment, right? And so what that's called is aposomatic coloration, which is called warning coloration. And so this guy is saying, hey, you know what? Here I am, but if you come towards me, I mean, I am going to mess you up, right? And so that's what aposomatic or warning coloration is going to do. So here in these pictures, you can also see aposomatic coloration. This plant has got its thorns bright red, so it's like, here are the thorns. You don't want to mess with me. Um, I took this picture in Costa Rica. I was so excited. This is actually an eyelash viper, and um, I think it's like the second most poisonous snake in Costa Rica. So, of course, I'm getting into the bushes and trying to get as close as I can to it because that's how I roll. But you can see how this thing is just standing out, and it's like, here I am. I could kill you in like 30 seconds, right? 
Um, this is another picture I took in Costa Rica, and um, that is going to be a poison dart frog, right? And so um, that was the size of my pinky, but it was so easy to spot it. Actually, not my pinky, my pinky nail. Um, it was so easy to spot it because of that crazy coloration, right? So that's going to be warning coloration. Now, another thing that should be coming into your mind when we talk about this is going to be mimicry. And mimicry is going to be where something non-poisonous might mimic something that is poisonous. So here are a couple examples. So I don't know if any of you know which one of these snakes right here is actually going to be poisonous, um, but it's actually going to be this bottom one here. Okay, so the little rhyme is red touches yellow, kill a feller, red touches black, you're okay, Jack. I think that's how it goes. Um, so you can see this guy is completely non-poisonous, but it's mimicking this one. And so what will happen is predators are like, you know what? I'm just going to avoid anything that looks like that, right? Um, but, uh, so this type of mimicry is called Batesian mimicry. And what that is is where you have something that is very poisonous and then something that is not at all mimicking it. So here is going to be the um, monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly actually is poisonous to birds because it eats um, milkweed, which is... Um, non-palatable for a lot of things but there are tons of butterflies out there that actually mimic that one and so this one is completely I think that's a gulf fritillary is completely un um, poisonous non-poisonous but it's mimicking this one now look at these three right here I just find this one to be amazing this top one is the poisonous one these two are two separate species that literally cannot um, mate with this guy none of these can mate together that's why they're separate species but this one's the only poisonous one, and these two are mimicking that one. Isn't that crazy? I just think that's so amazing. Okay, so that was Batesian mimicry. What I'm showing you here is something called Malarian mimicry. All of these butterflies that you see here are not poisonous. However, they taste bad and could make your stomach very upset. We're talking vomiting, diarrhea, that type of thing. So what this is, is more of a safety in numbers type of thing, where they're all kind of mimicking each other so that they're like a big general group that predators are going to avoid. Okay, so that's malarian mimicry. So no one's really poisonous. They do just kind of suck to eat. I wouldn't exactly recommend it. And so they're all going to kind of look like each other for that reason. Okay, moving on. Let's see where we are. Yes, parasites. Okay. So parasites are going to be predators because what they do is they actually harm the host in order to get nutrition. And there's two types. There are endoparasites and ectoparasites. This right here is an endoparasite, and this over here is an ectoparasite. So obviously endo means inside, so this is a tapeworm, and that's found inside your body in your intestines, and that's a little sample of one. Don't worry, we've got plenty of them in jars in the lab that you can look at. But kind of crazy when you look at their heads, right? So they actually have these little hooks, and they hook into the lining of your intestine, and they stay there because the food is rushing past, and they don't want to be pooped out, right? Um, and then they have these suckers on the side of their head, and that's how they suck out all the nutrients from your food. So lovely little guys, right? And then this right here is an example of an ectoparasite. Ecto meaning outside the body. Ticks, fleas, mosquitoes, any of those are going to be considered to be ectoparasites. Um, so this is a tick that is not engorged with blood, and this is a tick that has been engorged with blood, right? So they're a lovely, lovely group, right? Um, all righty. Now, that's all the really, really gross, kind of scary stuff. A um, little bit more about parasites. Um, I mentioned earlier how parasites might end up killing their hosts. If they do, that's called parasitoidism. And that happens sometimes, you know. I mean, technically we consider viruses to be a parasite, and there are viruses out there that kill you, right? So that's going to be called parasitoidism if that happens. Um, another thing that's interesting about parasites, um, eh, yeah, parasites most of the time, is that they can also be pathogens. They can be um, vectors for disease. So what that means is if you think about a mosquito, if you get a mosquito bite, not only is it going to itch, but you're also worried that you might have West Nile or um, what's the other one? Um, oh, God, West Nile. Or, um, oh, no, I'm thinking of ticks. Sorry. Um, ticks, right? If you get bit by a tick, you could be worried about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, those types of things. So those are going to be considered to be pathogenic parasites because they actually cause a disease as well as getting nourishment from you. All right. 
So that's all the scary stuff. Let's get into some warm, fuzzy stuff. Mutualism and commensalism. So these are going to be symbiotic relationships. So symbiotic means living together. So mutualism is going to be a relationship between two species where they both benefit. So the way I remember that is mutually beneficial. Okay. So I've got some examples on here to show you. Um, here is a picture of an acacia tree. And an acacia tree lives in the savanna in, in Africa. And what's really interesting about this is it has these little nectaries right here. You can see those little bubbles. And there are ants that live on that tree and they get their nourishment by drinking that nectar. So the tree provides that for them. So the ants have a place to live and a food source. And what happens is when that tree gets bit by an herbivore, it actually releases a pheromone recognized by the ants and the ants will attack that herbivore. How cool is that, right? So you got plants with animal bodyguards on them. And we will talk about some more that are really, really cool when we get into plants. Um, up here on the right, this, this is going to be um, a coral. And this is the bright stuff on it. It's going to be something called zooxanthellae, which is a type of dinoflagellate, which you will learn about. It's a protist. And um, what it does is it is photosynthetic. And so it provides the coral with nourishment from its photosynthesis, and the coral provides it with a place to live. That's one of the reasons they don't want you touching coral, because a lot of times you wipe off that zooxanthellae. And then down here is another really fun one that I actually did a project on in Belize, and it was so cool. Um, this is called a cleaning station. And so these little shrimp here are actually called cleaner shrimp. Um, and then this tang is the fish right here. And so what happens is the fish will pull up and it will open up all its gills. It'll open up its mouth so that these guys can get in and pick off all the parasites. So the fish is getting cleaned and the shrimp and the little fish involved are going to be getting a free meal. Super, super awesome. You can spot them a mile away. You'll actually see the fish all lining up and they've all just, just still, just like they're waiting at a car wash. And then one gets clean and then they all move forward. It's super awesome. So those are all going to be mutualism because they're both benefiting. Now, commensalism is a little bit different. Commensalism is going to be a symbiotic relationship, but one is benefiting and the other one isn't really getting anything out of it. So a couple of examples here. Um, here's the clownfish and the clownfish lives in the anemone. So the reason a clownfish chooses to do that is because the anemone actually stings. And so if a predator was going to go after the clownfish, it could dive into the anemone and the anemone would sting the predator. However, the anemone doesn't really get anything out of the whole deal, right? So um, that would be commensalism. Now there's research being done on that saying that maybe it does, but right now we're going to just say it doesn't. Um, and the way that the clownfish survives in there is it actually secretes a really thick slimy coat and that keeps it from getting stung. Over um, down here, this is a whale and uh, the side of a whale, and these are barnacles on it. And barnacles actually have like a little arm that they can stick out and they filter feed with it. So they stick it out, catches particles, and then they eat them. What better place to do that than on the side of a whale that's traveling miles and miles, right? They can just stick their arm out and woohoo, right? So um, they're going to get a benefit because they have a better chance of catching food, but the whales don't seem to be bothered by them, but they don't get a benefit from them either. And then this one is one of my favorites, the Cape Buffalo and the Egret. So um, there's a couple of different ways this relationship can go. But as far as commensalism goes, what happens is you've got this bird sitting on top of the buffalo. Um, and the buffalo is not getting any sort of benefit from that. But the bird likes to feed on the insects that are in the grass right here. So when this buffalo moves forward in the grass, it stirs up all of the insects. And so the bird can just... Nom, 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 it can eat its food, and so it's going to get a benefit. Pretty cool example, too, right? Um, another example of commensalism is going to be this bad boy that you see right here. So this is a remora that's living on a shark. And so what happens is the remora is just going to stick on, get a free ride, and then when the shark is eating and all the little bits are flying around, the remora can actually eat up those little bits. So a little warm, fuzzy way to end that little section. In the next section, we're going to start getting into food webs and how those work.